This podcast is brought to you by Rico, a market intelligence company helping clients achieve resilient, competitive advantage in the long term. The cutting edge is really thinking about what the systemic impacts are going to be. So what happens when everyone is experiencing some sort of extreme event at a higher frequency when multiple places, for example, in the United States at the same time are experiencing extreme weather and what happens to the socioeconomic system and feedbacks when that happens. Welcome to the Future and Sound podcast. I'm your host, Jen Wilson. This is a podcast where we talk about prioritizing people, planet, and profit in business strategy and decision making. We'll have different names for this, ESG strategy, sustainability strategy, maybe integrated strategy. Whatever glossy terms you choose, if you're in the thick of this stuff, you know there's no silver bullet. Like in any strategy, you can't prioritize everything, so there are trade-offs and different views to consider. In this podcast, we learn from world-leading experts who share bits of wisdom that can help us see the future we want and our role in it. This isn't a normal business podcast. We're not interested in the latest trend, jargon, or branding technique. Instead, we go beyond the headlines and look to clarify our long-term view on resilient economies, competitive business strategies, and decision-making best practice. This is episode four, ESG silos or systems. Quick story. When I think about climate science, I think about swarms of people with different viewpoints. In 2009, I was in Copenhagen for the COP15 conference. COP stands for Conference of the Parties. It's essentially a United Nations climate change conference where people from around the globe, representing various different countries, come together and they talk about what to do about climate change. This was before the Paris Agreement was negotiated, and I remember sitting in a massive auditorium where representatives from around the world were debating what to do to update the Kyoto Protocol and what that could look like. Imagine hundreds of people in a large conference room and a giant screen projecting a Word document that country representatives were debating. So you had people in the front, say, with the United Kingdom printed on a little card, and they'd put it up and they'd say, I think that we should be aiming for 450 parts per million or whatever else. So this was going on, and I remember just thinking, what a massive feat this was for us all to come together and decide what to do about climate change globally. What really struck me is that there are physical climate risks. So the risks that come with more extreme weather events, drought, fire, etc. And then there are transition risks. So as we move to a low carbon economy, the types of companies that are out there, the jobs available will change. And there are trade-offs there. These trade-offs impact people's lives. These are real challenges and it's very difficult to make perfect decisions that don't impact anybody. And this is why I'm thrilled to have Noelle Celine on the show. She specializes in understanding how climate change and the economy, people, interact. Essentially, she looks at how the E and S and ESG interact. When I say ESG, it's a term that's usually used to describe environmental, social, and governance considerations when we invest into companies. Professor Noelle Celine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Noelle, you're a climate scientist who works in the realm of climate policy. And one of the things that I've been thinking about, given that many of our listeners are from a business background, they read the headlines on climate change, they read the headlines on emissions targets, but they might not have a climate scientist in their circle who they can ask clarifying questions related to climate change and policy and all these things. So my my first question for you is, when we read about these uh, UN conferences where uh, delegates from around the world come together and they 
talk about the climate science and convert it into emissions targets. I'm wondering at a very high level, recognizing that you could teach a course on this subject, how does that happen? How do they take the science and turn it into these policy targets? Well, I think the first thing is that they're not taking the science directly and turning it into policy targets. I think what's happening at the international level is a, is a broad recognition that two degree and greater warming is a dangerous level of warming for the globe and that efforts need to be made to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to stay within that two degree target. Now, the problem is that what the science shows us is that in order to stay within that two degree target, those reductions have to be really large. And the problem that emerges is that at the international level, you have to get consensus on what that pathway is. And that's a really difficult thing to do. That's a difficult thing to do when economies are growing, when uh, people are expanding their uses of energy and where countries don't have the capacity to make large scale, very quick reductions. And so at the broader scale, I think one of the most important things to know is that the commitments that have been made, even if the Paris Agreement were completely, uh, were completely, if countries actually kept all of their commitments, we would not quite be on the two degree path and we would need to do a lot more action in order to get there. That's really interesting. And so when we think about the two degrees, actually, if we just take a step back for a second, why is the two degrees so important? Why are we talking about that as a target that we really need to stay under? Well, two degrees is important, but two degrees is actually pretty bad. Um, so, you know, a lot of people talk about 1.5 degrees as a threshold in which a lot of damages start happening. Uh, for example, uh, small island states are severely damaged at just 1.5 degrees. And so two degrees is, is a threshold that's broadly agreed by the global community as defining what dangerous climate change is. Some of the original climate treaties basically said, um, you know, we're gonna prevent dangerous anthropogenic influence on the global climate system. And it was only much later that the two degree target came to be broadly accepted and with a goal of 1.5 degrees as a reach goal to define that dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. It's interesting you say that. Um, for our listeners, uh, a really good document to summarize uh, a bit of the science uh, for policymakers. There's not quite an IPCC summary for business leaders yet. I think there should be. Um, but actually, the IPCC summary for policymakers is quite good. It's around 20 pages, and it summarizes sort of the high-level insights that we're speaking to. And Noel, correct me if I'm wrong, but the last summary was essentially looking at the difference between what would happen in a 1.5 degree scenario versus a two degree scenario. And it's pretty significant. Why, why is that? Yeah, that was, that was a special report that was done, done by the IPCC. Um, so it wasn't, wasn't part of the regular um, assessment cycle that they do, but it was a really interesting report because it really showed that as you increase greenhouse gases, the more you increase, the worse it gets. And what we're seeing is, a lot of systemic interactions and understanding the impacts that are happening. We're seeing impacts today. Uh, 1.5 is hotter than today, two is hotter than that. Uh, so we would expect to see those impacts increase. And what the 1.5 degree report is just categorizes and, and classifies what those increases will be. Mm -hmm. So in a broad variety of different sectors. It's really interesting because one of the things that uh, we see is that, you know, it's not as though emissions, once they go into the atmosphere, they go away right away, right? They sort of stay up there for a while, centuries, millennia. And so we're really talking about what's the overarching budget, not what's the rate at which we emit. Is that right? Right. To, to a first approximation, yes. I mean, the, the, earl the earlier we can reduce uh, emissions, the better, um, particularly from a um, socioeconomic point of view, but also from a, um, from a climate point of view as well. But, but yes, we're, even if we stopped emissions today, the temperature would still be going up for a while. Um, and so one of the really important things in the 1.5 degree report was the idea that 
in order to have a decent chance at 1.5 degrees, we're going to have to be at net zero emissions by 2050. Now that's only 30 years away. Um, and in order to have a fighting chance at two, that's 2070. And that's globally. And if you look at the challenges that, for example, municipalities, states in the United States have at getting to net zero, think about that globally in economies where people where, that are still developing, uh, where people still don't have access to energy, and you get a chance, a sense of the magnitude of that challenge. Absolutely. And before we get into, I guess, the people side of uh, climate change, which is an area of expertise for you, Noel, I'm interested, just you know, this is something that often comes up in conversation. When we read from scientists, uh, likely outcomes related to emissions, the word likely is used in some of these publications by the UN we also have ranges. And I'm wondering if you can help us to understand, for example, if a UN report were to say likely warming of, what does likely mean? Well, the IPCC has a very strict definition of probabilities that they associate with terms that like very likely, very likely, extremely likely. Uh, but I think the main thing to really understand is that scientists really understand the the magnitude and the overall impact um, but the uncertainties are really on things like distribution and some of the processes and some of the unforeseen feedbacks that that might occur uh, but in general we've known about the impact of putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere for a very long time those processes are extraordinarily well known and we know what direction emissions have to go in to mitigate those damages. And of course, there are scientific questions that climate scientists like me are interested in and in understanding more about the climate system. It's an area of active science, but in terms of the policy relevant picture, the way the knob has to go is quite certain. What's an example of distribution? The global average is something that's a very robust assumption of a model. One thing, uh, or a robust calculation in a model, it's a global average temperature. And when you're seeing temperatures increase across the globe, um, knowing that when you have a global average temperature that's two degrees higher than that, that, that there are going to be all sorts of different impacts is pretty obvious from a climate modeling perspective. When I talk about sort of what we are less certain of, it's things like extremes and precipitation and where and when those are going to occur and what quantification of risk um, one would associate with those. So things like prevalence of, of drought and extreme rainfall are less, less certain. In some, in some areas, we're making a lot of progress on that, however, um, in terms of agreements among climate models. There are some regions where that's more, um, more certain than others. Um, but in terms of global average temperature, you're really talking about a, a basic output that we've known for a long time. Great. I think that's really important for us to keep in mind. So we might not be able to say, you know, the I'm from Eastern Canada, so we might not be able to say in Eastern Canada, we are going to have uh, increased precipitation of this uh, percentage, but we will know on a more macro level uh, the directionality of that precipitation. And in some regions, we're getting there. Uh, I'm not familiar in particular with the, with the Eastern Canada projections, but in some regions, we are getting to the point where we can say you have an increased risk of, of extreme events and extreme precipitation um, elevated over, over the baseline and extreme heat events as well. That's really interesting. There are a lot of investors, for example, as, as you're aware, who have, they're investing in infrastructure and they're looking at climate risk what are, as we increase the granularity of our understanding of climate risk, what are some of the really cutting edge pieces of research that are coming out that can help us to clarify uh, risk that we should be paying attention to related to climate? Well, I think the real cutting edge is how much climate is going to affect everything. So I think business is getting much more familiar with thinking about impacts on weather directly. So extreme precipitation, hurricanes, um, extreme heat events, and how that's gonna affect directly relevant impacts. So if you're in a business where heat is 
relevant, you know, you're already thinking about that. I think what the, the cutting edge is really thinking about what the systemic impacts are gonna be. So what happens when everyone is experiencing some sort of extreme event at a higher frequency when multiple places, for example, in the United States at the same time are experiencing extreme weather and what happens to the socioeconomic system and feedbacks when that happens. So I think that's the real, in my mind, that's the real cutting edge of, of what we need to understand better. And that actually leads really well into my next section of questions for you, Noel. But before we get there, you, we are seeing some really interesting research coming out of uh, the PRI, so the Principles for Responsible Investment. And they've been partnering with a variety of uh, different organizations to look at, you know, what happens, I guess, so 2023, if we take a step back again, 2023, we're going to be reevaluating our progress on achieving targets, aren't we? And then recommitting to targets in 2025 at a global level. And they look at the scenario where we actually panic a bit, <laughs> you know, globally. And we say, shoot, like, we've really got to do something right away. Uh, and we sort of crash into this 1.5 degree uh, uh, policy scenario without methodical planning and getting industries ready, et cetera. Um, so sometimes between 2023 and 2025. And what they forecasted, this is slightly dated, this is before the pandemic that this was forecasted. They, they forecasted between 1.6 to 2.3 trillion US dollars in asset repricing. Winners and losers, obviously coal would be a loser. Winner would be automakers that are, in, are investing in making EVs, etc. But just this really interesting implication for the overlay between climate policy and our markets. Um, so that, I mean, it's, that's, that's part of this um, area of inquiry. We, just because in the past we haven't acted quickly enough on climate policy doesn't mean that it won't happen in the future. That makes a lot of sense from a climate science perspective. I think most climate scientists were there five or more years ago and saying there's a real disconnect between how things are valued and the kinds of impacts that are likely to happen in the future. And just that, that disconnect, the longer it goes, the larger that adjustment is going to be when it happens because the physical system is going to change. That's going to happen. So the question is, when is the economic system going to come in line with the physical system? And you know, that can be more or less rocky. Absolutely. And I guess one of the ways that the uh, investors, I guess, uh, perspective is shifting, we're seeing the emergence of this uh, ESG investment uh, approach where environmental, social and governance factors are being embedded into deciding which companies to invest in. Sometimes separating the E from the S and the G can be challenging. Noelle, when you look at climate modeling in the future, how do you take environmental and social factors into consideration? Yeah, so I really frame things in terms of sustainability. So thinking about human well-being maintained in the present and in the future. And some of my research looks at air pollution and climate interactions. So thinking about, for example, climate policies that we can put in today, um, moving to renewable energies, for example, that can have real very near-term benefits for people living right around sources um, and in those regions. So for example, we did a paper on, on the Midwest US and looked at transitions to renewable energy and showed that basically when you calculated out the reduced mortalities from traditional air pollutants, you would more than pay for the cost of that policy. And I think that's really illustrative of the kinds of impacts that haven't been priced in traditional economic models and thinking about who's benefiting and who's harmed. There's a lot of harm that's a result of fossil fuels today. And that is typically not incorporated in the price. And so I wouldn't separate ES and G, but I also wouldn't separate ESG from everything else and all of the other kinds of decisions that society is making because I don't think the economy can be treated separately from people either. Mm -hmm. 
It makes a lot of sense. And when you're doing, I guess, um, what I understand is called integrated modeling or assessments, in addition to uh, environment, what are some of the aspects that you consider? Well, so the kind of modeling I do is really trying to understand how we can figure out what those pathways are. What, what are the best kinds of policies or strategies or interventions and what will their impacts be on a whole system? And for that, you can't just use a, a physical climate, atmosphere, ocean model in isolation. You really have to understand what happens to people as well. So I integrate uh, some of the atmospheric models I use with um, economic models and with health impacts analysis and other kinds of quantitative techniques that can better say what happens to people and what are the feedbacks associated. And also using um, you know, frameworks and qualitative research as well to try to really understand what those pathways of potential change are and how to better understand them in ways that can inform policy and decision making. It's fascinating. And in particular, I would love to go through uh, the example of uh, air pollution and climate change and how you think about trade-offs there. Because again, if we're thinking about rating companies side by side on how they're performing for, say, environment, it can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Right. So you can think about, um, so you can think about actions to address air pollution, so particulate matter in the atmosphere, actions to address climate change. And you can think of some that are beneficial on one and not beneficial on the other. Uh, for example, if you take a power plant and you put some pollution control technology on, it can have a really strong impact on air pollution, but it could also actually increase energy use. So it could increase CO2. On the other hand, if you substituted that power plant with renewables, that would benefit both air pollution and climate. And you can also have areas where you can benefit climate, but not benefit air pollution. For example, if you have more sulfur pollution in the atmosphere, um, some of that sulfate particles can reflect heat, uh, reflecting coming solar radiation. And that will cool the atmosphere, but it's additional pollution. So you can think about those kinds of trade-offs and what you wanna find is the win-wins. You wanna find strategies that will benefit people and their health in the near term and also the climate in the longer term. And what we're finding through our research is that renewables are those win-wins to a large extent um, in a lot of places across the globe. Uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because you get economic effects and the question of what to do about beyond the energy sector, for example, transportation and agriculture and other issues. So those are the, the kinds of interactions that my group looks at. It's really interesting because if you looked at climate change in isolation, it might be more difficult, for example, for a policymaker to decide on a route forward, but you're adding a bit more of the nuance and complexity so that it can be a bit closer to to reality. Yeah, I think what makes sense is that policymakers will want to benefit people in the near term. So some of these efforts to ensure human health that can not harm the climate in the longer term are strategies that policymakers all across the globe really should be pursuing. I'm interested in the very messy and difficult question of trade-offs. And of course, one of the presentations that I saw from you, Noel, uh, during a TED talk, I believe, it was essentially a two by two matrix where you illustrated that there are some things that are good for climate change and bad for climate change on the X axis. Uh, and then for air pollution, some things that are really good for air pollution and not so good. And actually, you're talking about the upper right hand quadrant of this two by two. But I'd love to get into some of the more tricky quadrants where actually, you know, it's it's good for climate change, but maybe not so good for air pollution. If we if we pause there, how what are some of the decision making techniques that we can use if we get into the realm of outside of the win wins and we have to make trade offs? So I think this is this gets pretty complex pretty quickly. 
right? So for example, take the example I gave with putting pollution control equipment on a power plant. Now that's undoubtedly a good thing to do. On the other hand, it has some implications. Now, depending on how it's done and how that regulation gets into force, it can have some substantial near-term impacts. It can also have longer-term impacts, but the longer-term impacts have to do with things like investment and economies. For example, if there's a rule that comes in that mandates really advanced air pollution controls on particular types of power plants, this might be too expensive for some power plants to retrofit, particularly the, the older ones. And this might force some premature retirements. We've seen that um, in both the United States and Canada in response to some of the pollution control rules. Now, that mitigates the impact of the increased CO2, depending on what that kind of power is substituted for. Now, you know, you could then build a much more efficient plant, um, which still has fossil fuels, but might be more CO2 efficient and more air pollution efficient. So that gets a, a, another level of complexity. But if you're looking at then a brand new power plant with state-of-the-art pollution control, that locks in the the asset for a really long time. And that might be a claim on fossil fuels in the future that might be a very near-term win for air pollution. So the question is, what kinds of incentives are you putting into place? And, and that's where some of the trade-offs come in. So you could be improving air pollution quite a bit in the near term, but if you're not shifting to renewables, if you're shifting to another kind of fossil energy, you're locking in some climate impacts or some stranded asset risk, depending on what your idea of what's gonna happen in the future is. But it's not as efficient looking at the entire time scale. And I think one of the challenges with trade-offs is that climate scientists really think on a decadal and generational time scale. And you know, it's, it's uncommon for decision makers necessarily to do that. And I think it's an important advance in thinking that's necessary. It's interesting that you say that there are many initiatives right now in finance to focus on a more long-term trajectory, uh, maybe a bit more like a climate scientist, and uh, also some very interesting research that illustrates that actually that's, that's an effective financial uh, approach as well, if we invest in the long term, which makes a lot of sense if we think about something like, you know, developing IP, research and development. It's not like it pays back in the next quarter. But for long term competitive advantage, we need to we need to invest in the long term. Um, and it sounds like it's certainly the same for our policymakers as well. My next question for you ties to the role of business and recognizing, Noel, that your area of expertise is advising uh, policymakers and you're modeling the economy at a high level and not necessarily modeling individual actors. But still, I know that you'll have a take. Um, my question for you is, as we look to the future and we're looking to engage lots of different parties, including business, in the kind of climate policies that will get us to reaching the Paris Agreement targets. I'm wondering if there are any particular policies that business should be supporting in order to move in the right direction on climate. I think definitely thinking about how to get to fossil free as quickly as possible is gonna be critical. Um, so certainly the, the package of policies that reduces whether it's emission of fossil fuels or dependence on fossil fuels uh, will really put businesses in a better position going forward. And I think while some companies are realizing the magnitude of the challenge, um, that's one of the biggest hurdles to business action is a lot of the rhetoric on climate change from five to 10 years ago was think about efficiency, think about um, actions that are going to pay for itself by, you know, changing, changing some light bulbs and reducing your energy. And now that's just not going to cut it in terms of the magnitude that 
change of change that's needed. And we really need a systems level transformation. And the companies that are really get their head around that, I think will understand the challenge and be able to react to it in the ways that make sense for their own business. It's fascinating. And before I ask uh, my, my uh, final question for you, which is related to, uh, you know, any other comments you have for the business community from a climate science perspective, uh, an example that really inspires me along these lines is um, uh, Microsoft and Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, who announced that by 2030, they would be carbon, not carbon neutral, but carbon negative. And then also has targets around actually um, removing the amount of uh, CO2 that, uh, or CO2 equivalents that uh, Microsoft has admitted over its entire company history, which is really interesting. And when you dig into what that means, one of the bullet points that they indicate is, we're also going to use our voice to support climate policy that helps us move in the right direction. I'm, I'm paraphrasing something along those lines. And I thought that was great because it wasn't just looking at what our actions as a company are, but it's also looking at, well, how do we support the system within which we're in? And uh, so yeah, I wanted to mention uh, the Microsoft example, but the last question for you, Noel, any other comments that you have for consideration by the business community from a climate science or climate policy perspective? Yeah, I think that's a great example because it's an example of where companies are leading in this area and thinking ahead. And I think what I would say is that that's going to be a baseline minimum requirement before you know it in the sense that right now it's a very few companies who are really out in front. And if as we get into a warmer atmosphere, this is going to become more and more of a problem and more and more of a focus. And increasingly thinking about what that transformation means will be every company, not just the few that are out in front talking about climate change now. Dr. Noel, Celine, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a really fascinating conversation and I really appreciate the important work that you do. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you to Professor Noel Celine for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about her research in climate science, you can visit her website at selinegroup.org. That's Celine, S-E-L-I-N, group.org. Or you can just check out the links in our podcast description. The Future in Sound podcast is written and hosted by Jen Wilson and produced by Chris Attaway. This podcast is brought to you by Rico a market intelligence company helping clients achieve resilient, competitive advantage. Check out our website at www.re.co.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to tell a friend about it. And if you have a moment, rate us in your podcast app. Until next time, thanks for listening.